Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, we are going to talk about dynamic programming today, which is another dynamic optimization method. And to motivate the discussion, uh, we talked about how to compute open loop control policy, optimal open loop control policy for a dynamic optimization problem where we have a state and we have a performance index J of U, dtxt plus summation xt ut t goes from 0 to capital T minus 1. Okay. Now,
Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay, so let's think about uh, why is A, B better than A, E, D, B? Any thoughts? A, B is shorter than A, D, B. Can you say that again? Because A, B is shorter than A, D, B. Okay, so E, B is shorter than E, D, B. Do all of us agree with both the insights? Okay, so these two insights lead us to Bellman's principle of optimality. Which is as follows. Gamma star is optimal if and only if gamma t star to gamma t minus 1 star is optimal for the truncated problem. Truncated problem for every t in 0 to t minus Okay, and this is basically insight number two plus insight number one. That's the proof. Yes. In this case, yes, the GT is basically the distance between the two points, yeah. And in this case, there is no terminal cost. Okay. So, Bellman principle of optimality says a strategy, a sequence of steps is optimal if the tail of the sequence is optimal for the truncated problem. So, the truncated problem is I look at j of t which goes from gamma t to capital T minus 1 g t x t plus summation t equals o s equals to t to capital T minus 1 g s x s gamma s x s. Okay, so this is the truncated problem. I am looking at the problem starting at time t all the way until the end of the time step. And so that's the truncated problem. And for every truncated problem, my strategy should be optimal. And if this holds, then certainly gamma star is optimal. And this is an if and only if condition. It's a necessary and sufficient condition. Can you truncate it like in the other direction? Yeah, so I was trying to get at that. What happens if I truncate in the other direction? So why isn't it from gamma 1 star to gamma t star should be optimal? Yes. XT won't be the same, but how does that create a problem for us? There is something problematic about re replacing this with gamma 1 star to gamma T star. Okay, and just looking at the truncated problem from time T equals to 0 to capital to small t. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the graph. <laughs> Dynamic programming is way more general than a graph algorithm. 
Yeah. Just because the, the first half of your path is optimal, if you make a wrong turn or whatever, then it, it will no longer be optimal. Perfect. So if the first, first part of the path is optimal, so AE is optimal, and you take a wrong turn and take EDB instead of going from E to B, then that's not optimal. Okay? So this, uh, this leads to a more philosophical point. I don't know if you can pin down what that point is. You, I think you already know the answer because you do MPC for your living. But... Yes, okay. So it's uh, cost to go. So when you reach a point, there are multiple cost to goes and you want to make sure that your rest of the trajectory must minimize the cost to go from there until the end. Okay, so I'm going to make that notion precise. Uh, okay, so that's why uh, your tail has to be optimal and if this tail is optimal and you go back one more step, so let's, let's apply this Bellman's principle of optimality in this particular situation. So I am standing at B, I have three possible states, D, E, or C. Yeah, D, E, and C. These are the three possible states. And from D to B, of course, this is the optimal path because this is the only option. From E to B, oh no, actually there are multiple options from D to B. I can take this path, I can take D, E, B, I can take D, E, C, B. So there are three possible paths I can take. Um, and in this particular situation, D, to B, this particular path seems to be optimal. So your gamma star, gamma one star of D is this particular path. If you are at E, then E to B is optimal. So this is gamma two star, gamma one star at E, that particular path. Again, from E, you have three possible paths, E to B, E D B, and E C B. But this is the path that is optimal, that ma minimizes the truncated cost, which is going from E to B. And then similarly from C, I have gamma 1 star of C. Now when I get to A, which is my time 0, this is where I start with, there is only one state, A. And I have the option of going from A to D, A to E, and A to C. But what I would notice, the reason why AEB is optimal is because if I look at the total cost accrued from D to B, so let me call this VDB, VEB, and VCB, and VIJ equals to cost, optimal cost, optimal cost to go from I to J. If I look at the optimal cost, uh, the cost from A to D plus VDB is greater than the cost from A to E plus VEB. Okay? And that's why this is gamma 0 star A. I want to write this down formally. So the cost, let me call it G from AD plus VDB is greater than GAE plus VEB and the same thing GAC plus VCB is greater than GAE plus V. No, A, yeah, A, E plus V, E, B. Okay? So, that's the reason why this would be the optimal policy because only then gamma naught star, gamma one star will be such that the truncation is optimal for all truncated problems starting from zero all the way to T minus one. So, this is a two time step problem in that particular figure. And this leads to a philosophical point 
in dynamic optimization problem that your current action affects your future cost as well as the current cost, of course. So a myopic person will just minimize its current cost without worrying about the future. A more strategic person would look at the cost for the future and then pick an action which minimizes the total cost or maximizes the total reward. Okay, And there is a mathematically precise way of evaluating what's the cost moving forward, what's the optimal cost moving forward, and that is known as optimal cost to go or value function at that particular state. So now we want to apply the Bellman's principle of optimality. Uh, we didn't really write the proof, but actually we have talked about the proof uh, at the beginning of this class. So it works by contradiction. Uh, so we have talked about the proof. Now we are going to apply this proof, use this concept of value function to come up with a strategy or come up with an algorithm to solve this problem and compute the optimal strategy. So let me do that next. At this point of time, I'll take questions if you have any. DP algorithm. I define my V of T, XT as G of T, XT. There is nothing to minimize here. But this is my value function. Value function at time T, at time capital T. Now I need to go one step backwards. Um, I need gamma star t minus 1 to be optimal by principle of optimality. For the truncated problem. So the truncated problem is g of t minus 1, xt minus 1 plus v of t, xt. And this can be written as f of t minus 1, xt minus 1, ut minus 1. And I'm going to define this as gamma star t minus 1 argmin ut minus 1. Okay, so this is my optimal policy at time t minus 1, which is argmin for the current cost. Oh, this has to be a function of ut minus 1 as well. So gt is a function both of ut and xt. So I have to minimize the current cost plus the future optimal cost, but there is no action. So therefore, the future optimal cost is just the terminal cost. Now the terminal cost depends on xt, so I'm going to replace xt by ft minus 1 of xt minus 1 ut minus 1. So this is basically argmin 
of g t minus 1 plus v t composition f t minus 1. This argument is over u t minus 1. So, the current cost future value composite with the dynamics, the state dynamics at this particular time, at the current time. You do the argument, you get the optimal strategy and then I need to keep track of the value function because that's the optimal cost to go and that's given by the min of g t minus 1 plus v t composition f t minus 1. So I'm, I have a function of x t and u t. I minimize with respect to u t, so all I get is a function of x t. Okay, so this is the optimal cost to go, optimal cost to go uh, at t minus 1 uh, or the value function at t minus 1. Now I can apply this recursion again and again to have the following general form. So gamma star t of x t is argument u t of that would be my optimal strategy and v star t, not v star, v t of x t is min of u t of the same expression. And this is known as the DP recursion, dynamic programming recursion. Yes. So what you're saying is that the dynamic <coughs> programming works uh, backward. Yes. Could we do it forward? No. You can do it forward, but it won't lead to any optimality result. Why? So how would you do it? Let's let's try to think about it. How would you do it forward? So what is it that you are going to minimize at time zero? So I mean, by looking to the segments A, D, E. A, okay, A, E, B, and A, C, B, yeah. A, D, E, and A, E, and A, C, E. So I'm looking at, uh, at the running time. Mm -hmm. So I can claim that A, E is, be, uh, is the optimal or, or is better than A, D, E, and A, C, E. Then I can do also the same thing for the next segment. So I will get the same optimal product as if I did it from backward. Okay, I need to change the graph. Uh, you have focused too much on the graph. Uh, let me think. 
Okay, here is the graph E B A and C well not such a benign route. Okay. So this is so I look at the cost from A to E, it looks pretty large. I look at the cost from A to C, it looks pretty small. So I take A to C and then I end up with this Shenandoah National Park. <laughs> so how would you <laughs> how would you get there in minimum cost? <laughs> okay, so it that's that's really the key insight that Bellman had back in 1950s that if you want to minimize the optimal cost, uh, if you want to minimize the total cost and you want to come up with a closed loop policy, what you need to do is run the entire problem backwards, run the entire optimization backwards instead of running it forward. That would be the obvious intuition, let's run it forward, but his insight was actually we need to run it backwards. That's the only way we can prove the optimality of the overall process. And the theorem that Bellman proved is that this DP recursion is optimal. It leads to the optimal solution for this problem. Okay, that's his theorem. So he proposed the principle of optimality, used the principle of, op proved the principle of optimality, came up with this recursion, and then showed that gamma T star, so gamma star is, uh, follows the principle of optimality, okay. Any other question? Yes. Are you saving a cost for the cost of the cost of the cost of the cost of Yeah, that is the optimal cost. The value function is saving the optimal cost moving forward. For every measure. For every time. For, for every state as well. For every, and then you are choosing the next strategy based on, like you are considering all the Yes, so I'm looking at all the states, minimizing this function and storing it for an individual x and I'm doing it for all possible x that I would encounter at time t. Okay, so you're running a lot of optimization here, which is the main drawback of dynamic programming. So I want to focus on that again. The problem with dynamic programming is that I need to run this minimization for every value of xt, I need to store the value function at that particular value of xt, and I need to store the gamma star at that particular value of xt, and I need to do this for all possible xt in capital XT in this set, okay? So you can imagine the amount of memory requirement and computational requirement it needs to be able to solve this problem through a recursion. Now for smaller problems, it's not a big challenge to do it, but if you think about more complicated problems like a traveling salesman problem, uh, it becomes a very complicated problem. So what is the, uh, there's another variant of traveling salesman problem which is, so there are two problems. There is traveling salesman problem which says that I know during the day which points I need to visit so UPS knows which points it needs to deliver the packages. So the bus has to figure out what's the optimal path that it needs to take in order to drop off all the packages. There's another problem which is Uber's problem. Uber doesn't know where the passengers will request a service by the end of the day, and I shouldn't really say Uber because that's a specific company. Ride hailing companies don't know, uh, or, or, or a driver on a ride hailing platform doesn't know where the passengers will be, uh, will require a pickup and drop off during the entire day. So it needs to do the path planning in an adaptive fashion. So every time a request comes in, it needs to figure out what's the path to get to the origin of the passenger and then take him or her to the destination and then pick up the next passenger. So for that particular problem, 
you have to run this algorithm again and again, and that becomes a big challenge. Of course, nowadays, Google Maps solves this problem for us, so we don't really have to do it ourselves. But before Google Maps was around, which is definitely before, after your birth, you know, Google Maps wasn't there when you, when you guys were born. So at that time, people had to do it on their own, okay? And it was a very big uh, challenge. I, I think if you were going interstate, you would carry like big maps and you will figure out where you are and try to localize yourself. It used to be fun, not anymore, yeah. Um, could you, if you have a really big problem, could you just break it up into smaller problems and then run this for each? Is that like a method that people use or not really? That is uh, one way to solve this problem, yes. So a big mathematical problem would be if you are a ride-sharing, ride-hailing driver and you need to refuel on the way, then you need to figure out whether you should refuel first and pick up the passenger or pick up the passenger first, then refuel and so on. And you would essentially transform it into sub-problems, do the DP for individual sub-problems and then try to aggregate the solution. Um, and we will talk about some of the approximate dynamic programming stuff in the subsequent classes, so we'll get to it in a bit. Yes? Isn't it this problem as an offline search problem? I don't know what an offline search problem so is. So you're not updating your, like, um, you, like your distance to the, like, uh, the, your next step? Uh-huh. So you don't need to get information of your next step every time? That's right, okay. So that's a good point. So. You can, so in mo most situations, if the state space is known, if the state transition function is known, if all the constraints are known up front, you can actually solve this problem offline in the sense that you can solve it on a computer or a supercomputer. And then you can just store this gamma star t on the vehicle. And you look at the current state, whatever the state vehicle is in, and or I'm saying vehicle, but whatever the system is in, and then you apply the corresponding optimal control strategy. Like you evaluate what u star of t looks like, which is exactly equal to gamma star t x t, and then you apply that particular action to the, uh, on that particular system. Uh, so that's certainly doable, but the problem is most of the decision problems we face today, the environment as well as the dynamics changes very frequently. Okay, and in the case of uh, in the case of a car, it is very easy to see because your traffic light signal changes every at random points of time, and then you have people coming into your lane or going out of your lane at random points of time. So that completely changes the state transition function or the constraints you may have in your optimization, and. Um, and there you cannot really do everything offline. You can't do all the computation offline and then implement the algorithm on vehicle because of the fact that things are changing at every point of time. So to give you an example, why would FT change in a vehicle? So sometimes a vehicle carries one passenger, sometimes you have five passengers going out for a party, and that changes the mass of the vehicle. If, it change, if the mass of the vehicle changes, then the amount of power that is required by the vehicle also changes. In, uh, in an appropriate fashion. And so your optimal strategy that you would have computed for, let's say, a nominal mass of 2,500 kilograms uh, would no longer hold if there are five passengers or if there is one passenger in the vehicle, okay? So, so that's really the key challenge in doing all this computation offline because sometimes things change as you, um, Uber, in Uber's problem or in ride hailing problem, uh, the state would be where the passengers are calling for service. So the GPS coordinates of the passengers, UT would be the route that you need to take. And the GPS coordinates are changing at every point of time. And you can't really do this offline computation for all possible GPS coordinates, for all possible hour of the day or minutes of the day uh, for every point in the city. Okay, So it's a very complicated problem. Nobody wants to do it and store it so you have to do it as you go, okay? It's a complicated problem in that case. So this issue, this complication where, that you need to compute this for every possible state uh, is known as curse of dimensionality. So 
So as your state space grows, the amount of computation that is needed to solve the problem, solve the DP recursion is much, much higher, order of magnitude higher. So that's why it's called curse of dimensionality. High dimensional leads to longer processing times. I mean, exponentially longer processing times. And uh, uh, the recent uh, rise in AI and reinforcement learning is essentially trying to tame this curse of dimensionality using function approximators. So that's something we will talk about in EC8851, not in this class. OK. Any further questions? Yeah. So we don't know, like if we, so we would start this recursion at x capital T, right? We, sorry, you will? We would start with x capital T. Yes. And we start the recursion, but how would we get x lowercase t? Or you yes, so you do it for all possible x t. Okay. So you store it for all possible final states, and then you go backwards. So it has to be done for all possible states you're going to visit. Uh, throughout the time. Okay, let's solve, uh, or let me introduce a simple problem and in the next class, I'm going to apply the maximum principle to solve the problem and I'm going to apply the dynamic programming to solve the same problem. Um, and, um, and then we will try and see how the solutions differ and what are the properties of the solution. There'll be some very beautiful insights coming out of that particular exercise. So the problem is as follows. It's called a resource allocation problem. I have x naught amount of resource at the beginning of time. Uh, I get, I need to, so at every point of time, I have to invest UT amount of resource. So the leftover resource is XT minus UT. So UT is resource spent. And at every time when I spend the resource, I get some benefit. I get some profit, I get some benefit, I get some enjoyment. And that enjoyment, satisfaction, is log of ut. This is my running cost. My terminal cost is zero. I don't need any resource left over at the end of the time horizon. OK? Let's look at some examples. So the amount of resources, uh, the amount of oil in an in a, uh, oil field and UT is how, many, how much oil you need to extract every year, okay? So T is of the order of one year. Uh, so how much oil to extract in this year? And if I extract too much oil, the price of the oil is going to become low and therefore I won't make as much profit. If I extract too little oil, I will make some amount of profit, but I definitely want to maximize my overall profit over long term time horizon. So, Log of ut will tell you that, so log of ut looks like a concave increasing function so this is my log of ut so too little will give me what is log of zero it's minus infinity So it looks something like this. So too little oil doesn't really help me much. If I get too much oil, take too much oil out right now, that oil will be, of course, it would have come out. So in the future, I'll have less oil left. 
to exploit. And so I want to, but, but the price that I'm going to get or the profit that I'm going to earn is going to be diminishing as I increase the production of oil. So I need to figure out what the optimal amount of oil I need to take out at every point of time. Um, so that's one example. Uh, that is called hoteling model. Again, used in economics or economic uh, problems. Uh, another issue, is, another example is X naught is 24 hours for all of us. UT is the amount of time I'm going to spend on video games every hour, playing video games, not building one. And if I play too much video game, I don't get as much enjoyment. If I play too little, I don't get as much enjoyment. So I want to maximize my enjoyment over 24 hours. Um, I don't save anything at the end of the day. So I, there's no terminal cost. Maybe that's a bad example, uh, at least not for this crowd. Uh, what could be other situation where you have a resource and you, oh, retirement. This is the amount of retirement money you have. This is the amount you're spending every year. And this is your death, okay? So <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess that's also a negative example. Uh, and this is your enjoyment. If you take out a little bit of money, you will not be very happy. Uh, but if you spend a lot of money, it's not going to increase your happiness multifold, okay? So that's also another situation where you could apply this problem. Uh, there are many more variants, more sophisticated variants of this problem, which involves making sure that you amount for inflation, making sure you amount for uncertainties, um, and so on. But this is like the most, the simplest model, and this is what we are going to study in the next two class. So since we have time, let's try and apply the dynamic programming algorithm at the final time step and see what we get. So we can get closed form solutions in this case. So let's apply dp. So vt is equal to 0 because my gt is 0. So vt equals to gt equals to 0. So gamma star t x t minus 1 equals to min. Oh, this is the reward, right? So we want to maximize. Let me put a minus sign here so that we are minimizing the cost. So minimize minus log of ut, ut greater than 0. And of course, ut is constrained. So ut has to be less than equal to xt. Oh, it's t minus 1. So And there has to be argmin. What's the argmin here? So let's look at minus u of minus log of ut. Ut minus log of ut. So that goes like this. It's a monotonically decreasing function. So where would the minimum be? Minus x, not minus, it's just xt, xt minus 1. And what's my vt minus 1, xt minus 1? It's uh, minus log xt minus 1. OK. So at the final step, I should spend everything that I have 
we are bankrupt after that. Uh, and then this is my value function at time t minus one. This is this stores this information. This value function stores what's the optimal cost to go all the way until the end of the horizon. Any questions so far? Yes. Uh, this should be t minus one. Uh, x t minus one. How did I get that? So I want to minimize the minus log u t. So minus log u t is a monotonically decreasing function. So the minimum will only happen at the upper limit. And the upper limit here is x t minus one. I can't spend more than what I already have. So okay. So that gives me v t minus one. Let's try and uh, figure out what v t minus two is. Let me. It is this side. So gamma star t minus two, x t minus two equals to arg min. u t minus 2 greater than 0, u t minus 2 less than equal to x t minus 2 minus log u t minus 2 minus log x t minus 2 minus u t minus 2. So this is my plus v t minus 1 x t minus 1. That's what the last term is. Okay, so v t minus 1 is minus log x t minus 1. And I replace x t minus 1 with the state transition function x t minus u t. Okay. Any questions so far? How would I solve the minimization problem? <coughs> Any thoughts? No thoughts? Okay. So just so you know, uh, if you plot this function, if u t minus 1 goes to 0, this term blows up to infinity. If u t minus 2 goes to x t minus 2, gets closer to x t minus 2, this term blows up to infinity. So it actually looks something like this. The function looks something like this. So I can just apply the first order condition for optimality to get the optimal solution. So. Oh, I don't want to delete this. Oh, it looks like I'm out of time. Okay, so we'll what we will do is we'll pick it up from here. We'll apply the first order optimality to get x t minus two over two. Okay, so we'll do that in the next class.